Welcome everyone to section number four. This is indefinite integrals and the net change theorem. And as it says, right, we have two main topics. This video, we're gonna be talking about the indefinite integral aspects. So let's start off here with a definition. First of all, what is an indefinite integral? Indefinite integral, there we go. So the indefinite integral of f, well, it's written like the definite integral, but we don't have the bounds, right? We don't have these a's and b's any longer. It's kind of just the integral symbol here, no bounds. This is an antiderivative, antiderivative, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because we learned in uh, section number three, the fundamental theorem of calculus, that if you want to calculate a, a definite integral, right, this has something to do with an antiderivative, right? You take an antiderivative and then you plug in certain values. Well, if you don't plug in certain values, if you leave out this a and this b value sort of deal, well, well then maybe you just have the antiderivative itself. So that is, it's some function f of x where if you take the derivative of it, f prime of x, you get back to where you started. You get little f of x. Okay, and since indefinite integrals are antiderivatives, they have a lot of the same properties, right? Uh, so for instance, if you want to find the antiderivative of f plus g, that's the same thing as if you found the antiderivative of f, then found the antiderivative of g, and you added those results together. So to some extent, right, this is saying that we can distribute this integral symbol to kind of each piece sort of deal. Another property that antiderivatives have, and therefore indefinite integrals have, is that you can factor out constants. So if you have a k value, right, you can factor that out of the integral, and then you just have the integral of f of x dx times k. All right, and that's really all there is to it. This is really just new notation for antiderivatives. So all the stuff that we did in chapter nine of section number three, right, when we first introduced antiderivatives, Right? All those same problems will creep up again here, but with different notation. Okay, so let's go ahead and try a few problems here. Find the most general function f of x with the property that, and then it lists the derivative, f prime of x is equal to 1 over root x plus cosine x. So that is, I would like to go ahead and find the indefinite integral of 1 over root x plus cosine of x dx. So when I do that, well, maybe a first step would be actually to rewrite this even further, right? I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this as x to the negative one-half power plus cosine of x dx. And now I'd like to go ahead and find, right, a function whose derivative is x to the negative one-half. So I'm going to start with maybe x to the positive one-half, right? Because if I took the derivative of this, I would reduce my power by one, and I'd have negative one-half. And then I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the reciprocal of the exponent here. So this is going to be 2. So now double check. If I took the derivative of this, do I get back to where I started? Yes. OK. So, so far, so good. And then something that is uh, has the derivative cosine. Well, sine has the derivative cosine. So I'm going to use sine of x here. And then, again, we want the most general function. So I'm going to go ahead and do a plus c. All right, so this is how we can use our new notation of indefinite integrals to solve you know, problems that we've essentially done before. Okay, I have one more problem for you. I recommend pausing the video, trying this one on your own, and then I'll go ahead and spoil the surprise. So again, take 90 seconds or so, get as far as you can, and then we'll talk about the solution. All right, so I just went ahead and wrote down our indefinite integral here. Now, the big thing is that we have to remember that there is no product rule, or there is no quotient rule in addition, right, for antiderivatives. So whenever you come across something like this, our strategy is we have to get rid of the product of these functions. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute. And that's good because I didn't know what the antiderivative of secant was anyway. So maybe this will save us a little bit. So I get secant x tangent x plus secant squared x. So I need something whose derivative is secant tangent, and I need something whose derivative is secant squared. And so this is where we really have to remember right, our trig derivatives and the fact that secant has the derivative secant tangent, and tangent 
as the derivative secant squared, right? So if I take the derivative of tangent, I would get secant squared. If I take the derivative of secant, I would get secant tangent. So therefore, the antiderivative is secant x tangent x. Again, I want the most general antiderivative in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and do the plus c. So again, this is a topic that we've covered before with antiderivatives. Now we just have slightly different notation. All right, so that's a nice short video. That's all there is to it. Take a break. I'll see you guys next time.